Do not adjust your television set. This video is not only my first black and white video on this channel, but it's the very first Filmmaking with Brass Knuckles interview. I talked with Jeff Kitchen, who's been teaching dramatic writing since 1989. Did you know that in 1901, a fellow named W.T. Price opened the first school of dramatic writing in America? Maybe the first school of its kind anywhere. 24 of Price's students went on to write Broadway hits. In today's interview with Jeff, he gives some insights from his 35 years of teaching, as well as what Price taught to those Broadway writers over 100 years ago. This whole YouTube channel is new to me, and I had a couple technical issues that were best solved by hearkening back to the old-timey days of black and white images. Jeff Kitchen wrote the books Writing a Great Movie, Key Tools for Successful Screenwriting, and The Hero's Dilemma. And if you visit his website, script.kitchen, you can learn about his blog, his two-year apprenticeship program, and his video classes. Here's a quote from one of Jeff's books. People are starving for great stories, and something inside of you is screaming to give it to them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a writer. Enjoy. I not only read your book, Jeff, but but I read um, William Thompson Price's book. I, I read the whole thing uh, over the weekend. Wow. And so I'd like to go back to 1908, I think, when that was when that was written. And you yeah. obviously have a playwriting background, but, you know, can you unpack what theater was like? Because obviously this is before cinema is really... There is, there are movies, there's early cinema in 1908, but basically not that we know it. Theater's right. kind of the king, maybe vaudeville even, but but uh, what's your view of, you know, people wanting to be playwrights like they want to be screenwriters today? Was that, with, how many how many plays were on Broadway? Was I'm not exactly sure. I've been kind of getting back into it again. I just read Act One again by Moss Hart and... Uh, about his first big hit with George S. Kaufman. And it's, it's uh, you know, it was that, was, that was the peak as far as entertainment, as far as I know. Uh, there was, um, I don't think Broadway looked anything like what it does today, but I think you were starting to see some inklings of that. I think it was still like, probably dirt streets with horses pulling carts like vehicles were probably a rare sighting at that point um i know that the theater i think the music box but i know david s belasco was a producer who constantly well he had price revise every script he was going to produce and he was a huge he had a lot of hits on Broadway. Um, and Price was born 1846, died in 1920. So at 198, he's very much at the height of his powers. He, he um, basically, he created this tool, the proposition, uh, based on his training as a lawyer, that he could state the complete action of a court case simply and clearly using a syllogism A and B, therefore C. He said you ought to be able to state the complete action of a script with that level of simplicity and clarity. And he invented this tool, kind of adapted a tool of the logic of argumentation and applied it to plot construction and the, law, the argument that's going on on stage. Uh, so he read a lot of plays. He um, fixed a lot of plays for people. And so many writers asked him for playwriting advice that he ended up forming the American School of Playwriting in 1901, which is supposed to be the first school of playwriting ever in the history of the world. He had 28 students and 24 of them had hits on Broadway. Uh, he he was, as far as I can tell, right at the center of the action on Broadway. Uh, you know, I'm sure with other people, but he was he was a serious, hardcore 
you know, specialist in the craft of the dramatist who was um, teaching people, but right at the core of revising things that were going up and cleaning things up and clarifying and that. I am hungry to read more of the stuff of that era. Uh, I just found a biography of George S. Kaufman, but that's even that is, you know, 20, 25 years later than, you know, 1900 when Price wrote his first book, 1908. He wrote The Analysis of Play Construction and Dramatic Principle, and then in 1912 he wrote The Philosophy of Dramatic Principle and Method, and then he died in 1920. And so I wish I knew more about that. Yeah. Era. It's a, it's you know I think Ibsen and Chekhov are around that era in there yeah, and, and I think I remember reading at one time you know those few people would go to the theater to see Ibsen but he was widely read around the world and so the influence was was in the writing and so I'm 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 just enthralled by that era because you know you have you know the Wright brothers you have all this invention all this things that are that are happening and you know cinema is really. 10 or 15 years from really taking off at that point. So do you think, think so, yeah. do you think Price's work in his study from 120 some years ago, do you think it translates to screenwriting today or do you cherry Absolutely. pick things that, yeah. Yeah. It translates extremely well because it's still the craft of the dramatist and it's, Dramatic writing is still considered the most elusive of all the literary disciplines. To take a good story and turn it into a great script so that it's actable and continuously compelling, that's extremely tricky because so many people put all this energy into stories that don't work, that aren't marketable, don't they just don't have the juice to enthrall an audience for two hours. And then for the people who start with a good idea, um, then you still have to construct it properly. There's so many ways for it to go wrong. You know, it, it has to be actable, which is people forget that it's a performance medium and that it has to be not only actable, but you have to stage a story and so that it can be acted out and it has to be continuously compelling, which means people are always on the edge of their seats and that they're in a state of action trying to figure it out emotionally, figure it out intellectually, who was the killer, how did they sneak the gun in there, and Conversely, like, how come I don't care now? Why am I not up on the edge of my seat? Why am I checking my, you know, my pocket watch and thinking about what's happening later tonight? You know, you got to, as, as Billy Wilder said, you got to grab them by the throat and never let go because they're <laughs> so fickle and they're, they're so easily distracted. So it's tricky to, to essentially translate a good story into a great script so that it succeeds in a very fickle and slippery performance medium. So yeah, you know, one art. of the things that impresses me about Price is that I think, I think I read, or maybe you told me as well, that there were like 24 Broadway writers that kind of, that had hits that came out of his, his teaching, yeah. which is very impressive. <clears throat> yeah, he had 28 students and 24 of them had hits on Broadway. <laughs> The um, the quote that I have that I that I wrote down to the French classicists used to say that action should begin at an important at, at an important day the eve of the battle and the like and so that's that's over a hundred years ago advice and when you say that people are writing screenplays that aren't holding people's attention that's what I think of is is another way of putting it is the screenplay should be about the most important day of the person's life, something like that. And one yeah. of the, one of the movies Unity that you mentioned, of action. yeah, one of the, one of the movies that you mentioned in your book, which I think holds up probably as well, even maybe even better than the Godfather is training day. And when you use the yeah. Billy Wilder quote, quote about grabbing them by the throat, 
I will never forget. It's been over 20 years since I first saw Training Day, and I've seen it a few times since. But, but when Alonzo, the Denzel Washington character, stops the car in the middle of traffic, cars are honking, and he basically takes the PCP pipe out and says to Ethan Hawke, smoke yeah. it or not. That's yeah. kind of the best or worst day in, in Ethan Hawke's life as that character, right? I mean, that's kind of, there's, there's no other day. There's nothing else that is more important for him, right? Because that's the dilemma. That's another word that you like to use. That's the dilemma, yeah. right? His dilemma is, do I smoke it or do I not smoke it? Um, right. What is yeah, it about training day that you think kind of encapsulates so much about what you teach? Well, it's a absolutely riveting drama. And the the oldest Greek theater was only two characters on stage. The introduction of a third character by Sophocles was considered a major dramatic innovation. And my playwriting teacher, Irving Fisk, talked about how it really comes down to two boxers in a ring and only one of them is going to walk away. So it's a fight to the finish and it's all, you know, unfurling on stage. And the other thing that my playwriting teacher taught me was that and this has always fascinated me. He said that Aristotle noticed that those dramas that grip an audience tend to have a good, strong dilemma that builds to a crisis, forces a decision, forces a decision in action about the dilemma at the point of crisis, and then the protagonist ultimately resolves, conclusively resolves the dilemma. And that's how it was taught to me in the oral tradition, that this was observations that Aristotle made from seeing so many plays. Each year, Athens had a religious theater festival and everybody was assigned a topic. So Aristotle would see many plays on the same topic and could compare and contrast. But as I taught it that way over the years, one time somebody said, I looked in the poetics and didn't see anything about dilemma in there. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And I, I looked some more and Irving had already died in 1990. So I never got to go back to him and say, hey, what you said, Aristotle said this, but like, it's not written anywhere. And other scholars are like, yeah, Aristotle never wrote about that. And so I stopped like in my new book, The Hero's Dilemma. I don't talk about Aristotle in that context because I don't want to be like, misquoting history and I don't have the you know the pages to back it up so I just kind of sidestepped like okay it was taught to me that these were observations by Aristotle but I don't teach it that way anymore um, but Jake has a good strong dilemma in training day two equally unacceptable alternatives and that's something that I use in training writers a lot because it's so it's such a crystal clear dilemma you can see it you may not notice it consciously even though your whole physical chemistry is aware of it you may not be able to articulate it consciously but once you hear it you're like oh of course because it's his ambition versus his moral compass it's unacceptable to um, it's unacceptable to let go of this opportunity to make it into Alonzo's elite undercover narcotic squad. Like nothing is going to pry him away from this opportunity. And if he has to smoke dope in the middle of a street, you know, with 110 people watching, he'll do it. He tells Denzel when he gets in the car, he says, I will do anything that you want me to, to make it into your squad. So nothing's going to make him let go. And yet he also has a strong moral compass and nothing is going to make him keep doing the slippery criminal stuff that Alonzo's dragging him into. So Jake is constantly uh, appalled and impressed by Alonzo. And so it's a... 
it's an interesting illustration of a protagonist caught in one good, strong dilemma. And that dilemma carries the film. That's what the film is about. And so it makes a great teaching example because the dilemma is so crystal clear and easy to see. I'm not sure if I actually answered your original question. Yeah, no, I think, I think you, I think you did. I think it's, okay. you know, I think it's maybe in your book, you also talk about, you know, it's, it's the dilemma is also work with your hero, take your hero down, which is just a great, again, a boxing analogy of, uh, of, um, you know, my book called Screenwriting with Brass Knuckles, I, I use that. We haven't talked about that, but but I use the brass knuckles from when I was a kid. I would watch uh, professional wrestling that was a lot more amateurish back when I was a kid. And inevitably, somebody would pull out some brass knuckles and and start hitting the person. And, and I always just just thought that was that was what we needed. We needed something to kind of punch it. And I think of that scene. I think of that scene. It doesn't have to be a physical hitting, but just just right. compacting to where it impacts the audience, which is another part of your teaching that I really liked. Um, you really talk about being kind of audience centric, that you're writing for an audience. Yeah. And I think a lot of people Absolutely. don't think that way. Um, no. why, is the, why is the audience or the reader, maybe even before that, so important? Well, because it's all about the audience. They're, the only thing there is, is the audience. You're staging a show on a, you know, a physical stage or a sound stage. It's, it's all for an audience. It's, it's, it's all comes down to the fact that a movie playing to an empty theater has no power. It's just shadows on the wall. It's literally nothing. If, you know, if they're running, if they're screening The Godfather and nobody's in there, the movie has no power. The power of the film resides in the response of the audience. And anyone who's ever acted in live theater knows that intimately because there's a, there's a chemistry and, and an alchemy, uh, this, this relationship between the actors on stage and the audience. The audience is actually the third character. And anyone who's done live performance professionally will know that you can be in a hit play and like people are flocking in to see it and last night was phenomenal and they were absolutely riveted and tonight it's the exact same show and they're fidgety and they're nervous and like it's not working and you don't know like what what the hell are we doing tonight that is like the audience is dead in the water and it's it's huge. If you don't have the audience, then you're dead. And if you lose the audience for four minutes, that's an eternity. It's, you know, it's like radio silence in radio. It's like you got to always have them on the edge of their seat. It's all about a term called dramatic action, which is a state of action that you put the audience in where they're trying to figure it out. They're, it's a subjective state of excitement and they're riveted. So if they're not riveted, then you don't have drama. You just have information. You talk about um, back, let's jump to 1999, back from uh, 1908. And 1999, some people say, is one of the best years of cinema. Uh, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, Menace came out. Star Wars The Phantom Menace came out. And you talk about, you know, people would camp out to get tickets and long lines. And, you know, that was an exciting time for cinema. Recently, writer-director Paul Schrader was asked um, if filmmakers were better in the 70s because there was so much compelling drama made there. And Schrader actually said this. I want to know if you agree with this. He said, I don't think filmmakers were better in the 70s, but I think the audience was better in the 70s. Do you think with the Internet and gaming and cell phones and streaming, do you think it's harder to, to capture the audience today in in certainly in theatrical or maybe even streaming. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I think that the 
attention span has shrunk. You have to, you know, I'm in theaters where people are texting and I, I like, I want to get like a squirt gun or a laser that can actually like injure their phone. Like something that like, turn that shit off, man. Because it's like this bright screen, like in the middle of it. Um, and MTV changed the attention span because everything became um, edits per second. There was some term that entered the lexicon at that point of how many edits per minute or something like that. But it be, instead of being like, you know, a, a slower pace like you might see in The Godfather, it's more like chop, 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 which, you know, lends itself, when it's done well, it lends itself to an enhanced telling of a story in a visual medium. I'm not saying that was the end of filmmaking. It, you know, it, it amplified good aspects of it in many ways. But it's interesting to think back to, like, audiences were better back in the 70s. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I think audiences are more sophisticated these days and have experienced a lot more storytelling and... Kids these days are such a more sophisticated audience than, like, nine-year-olds were back in 1972 or something. But I think there was still, like, what Tarantino talks about, like, it was still like church going into the movies. Um, and I still treat them like that. I sit in the front row of like the Cinerama Dome or a man's Chinese theater and I just want to, a Grauman's Chinese theater and I want to like be in the movie and it's you know I really want as much of the experience as possible. I remember I took a buddy of mine we went to the the Cinerama Dome for a, a screening of um, Lawrence of Arabia and I said I said, oh, you got to come sit in the front row center with me. He goes, are you out of your mind? And I was like, no, you won't believe it. Because it's like, it's not like you're crammed up against the screen. There's like 30 feet of carpet. And then there's the movie. And he came up there. He goes, all right, I'll try it for a bit. And he was in there. And, you know, movie comes up. And they're all the sand. And, the, and it's like you're in. And he was like, oh, my God, this is astonishing. It's like you're in the movie. I was like, no kidding. It's like I can't get enough of that. And. What did I just see the other night? Oh, I saw um, The Boy and the Heron, front row center. And, like, you'd think it was too close, but it was like, I got in there, I sat in the second row, and there's still the hump of a seat in front of me, and I'm like, no, I'm just go right up to the front row. And it was, you know, there was other people in the theater, not that many, but it was kind of like a private screening in a sense, that it was just so intimate. I mean, there I was more like 12 feet from the screen, but it wasn't a massive screen, but it was, it was a fascinating experience. And I've done that a lot. Yeah. I think the last movie that I really felt like that would, would have been 2019 uh, with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where I lived in LA in the, in the early mid eighties, the movie takes place in 1969, but a lot of those artifacts and buildings and the right. Cinerama Dome and Muso and Franks, that was all there. But I just, I, I was just there. I mean, that was, it was a very emotional movie that, um, that just took me there, but it's very rare to have that experience, uh, for any, right. um, for me these days, you talk about, here's a quote that I like that you ha you have in the book. The job of the screenwriter is to be a bomb maker and a poet which I think maybe Tarantino comes pretty close to that. Uh, what do you mean by that? Can you unpack that a little bit? A, a bomb maker and a poet. Sure. Um, it goes back to something you were getting at before, which is that to have a good, strong dilemma, you've got to torture your protagonist. Put them in... It's easy to treat your protagonist too well and let them off the hook because you like them. But the fact is that the more you put them on the spot, the more compelling the drama is. So um, imagine that you put 
a torture hat on your worst enemy and set the screws to get that person screaming because you really hate that person and you want to put some extra juice on it, then take that torture hat and put it on your protagonist and set it that tight and get your protagonist really screaming. And now your audience is really on the edge of their seat. And I think the, cr the cross between being a bomb maker and a poet as a screenwriter is that you're trying to blow things up in a way to challenge the audience, to shake them up, to put them through the blender, a, a, a powerful emotional experience. Um, well, it's actually Martin Luther King Day. It's a Martin Luther King quote. A powerful emotional experience is the first step on the road to commitment. The idea that you can really shake somebody up and change how they think. I mean, that's that's so much of <clears throat> the whole process is that you can, like, give somebody such a powerful experience that you almost break something in their brain, like something that said, fragile, do not touch, and you come in and smash it with a, you know, a battering ram. It's, it's the chance to permanently change the way audience members think. And that's part of the challenge. And, you know, you're doing it with language and poetry, but you're trying to have a really world-shaking, revelatory experience for the audience member. And, you know, you've probably seen movies like that where you come out of them and you're like, oh my God, it's like, I, I'm a different person. I'm never going to see the world again. I'm I'm not going back to what I used to be. It's, and that's rare, and people hunger for that. And it's, it's always lurking there in any story you're telling. Like, sure, this might be a fun romantic comedy that's really sweet and fascinating, but you're always looking for, is there a way I can really come in for the kill? And not, and, and I'm, and that's not to say that I'm trying to violate the nice, friendly experience of a great romantic comedy. I, I respect the tone of any story. It's like the story is the boss, and, and yet the degree to which you can discover in the material something deeper, more ecstatic or transformative or awakening like I was working with uh, one of my advanced students <clears throat> and he's been working on this script for a while and at this junction in the story we just finished structuring one part of it he said I think that there's something much more dangerous to play with at this junction I feel like like going on ahead the way I do, I'm missing something. And we talked about it for like an hour and the opportunities and the films that inspired him the most and some of the roles that he's using for inspiration here. And I said, well, you are you could go much deeper into that aspect of the inspiration. I said, it's really kind of like you stepped in a black hole here. And like there's infinite depth and a lot to explore and like you know, take your time and really set off some depth charges and, you know, get to the bottom of this instinct you have before you, because you can throw away the structure, the, the, the structure of the, the, the script's second half and build it much more. And he's really up for it. And it's, you know, it's, you're kind of feeling your way along. And often it's like, yeah, that's what I intended. Here it's going here. The tone's holding well here. It's getting funnier. We're moving toward the crisis. And it's all like the thing that you're trying to create. But sometimes you hit like what I call a soft spot. And it's like, there's a really interesting opportunity here to go deeper, more funny, more dangerous, whatever it is. It's like, it's really like having like a tunnel drilling machine that feels the edges of the walls. And as it's like drilling, it's also feeling the walls and like the feelers come into this thing and they're like, 
uh, there's no wall here anymore. Like you just tunneled into a cavern and like it can tell. And you're like, that's a great thing when you're writing to kind of stumble into something deeper and bigger and more compelling in an, in a way that's unexpected for you, the writer. And that translation from the writer of, wow, we just stumbled into this much bigger, more dynamic story, that's going to come across in the writing. And it's, you know, it's part of the fun of the job is that you're, there's like a killer instinct that's always waiting to get unleashed on something, even if it's like you find out that the the sweet romantic comedy you've been working on just turned into Dumb and Dumber, and you're like, holy <laughs> shit, this is like the most whacked out, funny goofball, like, dude, I'm totally diving all head in. It's not like, oh, it just got much scarier. Whatever it is just opened up sometimes exponentially, and you just want to always... It's the, it's the flexibility as part of the habits of mind of a trained dramatist to always be getting an accurate readout of what you've got now because it often changes minute to minute and you want to be in touch with what's evolving that you're not just put it on autopilot and get to the end of the story. You always have your radar out for... Is there, like, is this clever little script turning into something that's going to, like, change how people think forever? Yeah, that whole idea that you mentioned about, you know, a movie that sticks with you and maybe changes you, it, it brings me to another quote of yours from your book. All great or good plays are based upon theme. Um, do you think... Do you think the writer's always conscious of the theme? I, I've heard some people say, you know, I discover the theme while I'm writing it. I've heard other writers say, uh, Coppola, whether he was joking or not, but Coppola said, I, I usually discover the scene when I'm watching the movie in the movie theater, which is, which is, which is interesting. But he's, you know, Godfather has a very strong theme, I think. But yeah. um, is when you're working with students, where do you think theme comes in with something that's going to resonate beyond just the story? Just, you know, movies that affected me were on the waterfront. Um, I may have seen that on a, on an old VHS and it just, it just hit me very powerfully. And yeah. certainly the verdict, even toy story three, those are three very different movies. Yeah. Like Rocky, uh, Shawshank redemption. People talk about it. Obviously most people have never been in a prison, uh, but yet they talk about Shawshank Redemption. They can make that connection to the theme of, like you said, yeah. of just getting pounded. But but where does theme come in to you when you're talking to writers? Yeah, theme comes in because it's the way that I teach is that we start with dilemma. And um, I'm, I'm running a class on that now that I just taught the other day in which I brought a raw idea that we'd never worked on before. I told them the idea and I said, okay, let's start looking for dilemma in this story. Like literally, I said, here's my idea, let's find dilemma. And I pointed out to them, I said, I just showed you this idea. This idea is now nine seconds old and we're <laughs> looking for dilemma first thing. We're not doing anything else. So that's the way I work. We want to trap the protagonist in a good, strong dilemma. And we want that dilemma to kick in somewhere before or around the end of Act 1 for the protagonist to be really trapped in this dilemma. And then all throughout Act 2, that dilemma gets more and more intense until it comes to the breaking point, which is known as the crisis. And the crisis forces a decision about the dilemma and an action about the dilemma and propels the protagonist toward the resolution of the dilemma. So the core model of any story I'm working with in any genre is trap the protagonist in a good strong dilemma early on that carries throughout the whole rest of the story until it's conclusively resolved at the end, but it comes to its breaking point around the end of Act 2, 
uh, which forces decision and action about the dilemma, and then a the protagonist conclusively resolves the dilemma, even if it's a tragedy and they resolve it by getting everything wrong yet again. And like in Hamlet, Hamlet dies and the whole royal family dies because he's screwed up yet again. Um, so that's the primary model that I go to in story building. There's lots of other stuff, but I do that first. And the way in which the protagonist resolves the dilemma expresses the theme of the story. So by wrestling with dilemma and bringing that to its breaking point, forcing the protagonist to deal with the dilemma and then in the end to conclusively resolve the dilemma. Uh, and you can see that in Training Day, for instance, um, or Shawshank Redemption, uh, or any films with great thematic depth. It's that you, you're not looking at, <clears throat> at what the protagonist does to resolve the dilemma, but the way in which the protagonist resolves the dilemma. And so if you look at the way in which Jake resolves his dilemma of whether to, um, like it's unacceptable to let go of his ambition, but it's equally unacceptable to let go of his moral compass. He resolves, he conclusively resolves that in the end. <clears throat> He's no longer trapped. Oh, should I give up some of my morals to make detective, to be, to, you know, to, to join Alonzo's elite undercover narcotics squad? Or should I give up on my, you know, my ambition? He conclusively resolves that, and the way he does that is by really defeating Alonzo and defeating Alonzo's infinitely tricky manipulations that never end. And it's over. And there's a greatness of heart, and there's a greatness of spirit and character. Um, my pretty much my favorite quote is character is above genius. Um, character is the governing element of life and is above genius by George Saunders. And like, that's what training day is about thematically. So it's a, it comes from grappling substantially with whatever dilemma might be in your story and looking at the resolution of that dilemma and the way in which the protagonist resolves the dilemma that enables you to see what's emerging thematically through the complete action of the story. And to do that fairly early on in the process so that the theme of the story is apparent to you, but there's a really important <clears throat> aspect of the process that I've evolved over the years, which is that when you first, as a writer for a story that you're in the throes of creating and constructing, your first sense of theme might just be a general sense of it. And I urge my students to not worry about trying to articulate it early on because you only have a sense of it at first. But I said, that's really, really good because you know what your story's about. Now that will get refined as you work with it and your ability to articulate it will grow and become enhanced. Um, <clears throat> but just knowing what it is and really it comes down to like knowing that trying to articulate your theme before you have a full grasp of it it gets you in trouble because you're trying to cook something down to words that you don't understand at the word level yet we were we were um, pre-vocal, is what they call it, for hundreds of thousands of years as a species where we didn't have speech and yet we had 
much of the minds that we have today. So we're a race that is, in terms of evolutionary scale of time, quite used to knowing something in our gut, knowing something in our heart, and not worrying about the words for it. So that the there's a tremendous freedom in knowing what the theme is, and yet not being able to articulate it yet. And that's a, that's a, it has to do with something that writers are faced with a lot. Uh, my advanced student was just talking about it. He said, I don't like being part way into a problem and sort of getting stuck in it. And I said, but that's where you spend a lot of time as a writer. You have to learn to be you have to be able to hang out in this uncomfortable zone where you have a partial understanding and be able to like just kind of be okay with being partially born or partially understanding something or not being able to articulate something yet even though you understand it. You just kind of have to hang out there and gradually your night vision will kick in and you'll see it more clearly like oh it's that and that and it's really good that you don't rush into trying to articulate things that the the part of your brain that can put words to it hasn't caught up with you yet and it's a really important part of feeling your way through the creation and development of a story where you're going like, I, I can see there's an interesting potential solution here and it's not what we'd been talking about, but it's kind of this and it's sort of that. Like I just, just, just did this with my advanced students the other day as we wrestled with um, a story that we're building and I said, I just have a hunch here and I said, it kind of plays on this, but it does the other thing we were thinking about backwards, but it's more interesting. And after a while, they could get what I was talking about. And I was like, this is much deeper than what we've been playing with. And it gives it real roots instead of we're just cruising past something. So, like, theme orients you as a writer because it's what's coming across to the audience through the complete action of the material and part of what I talk about is like don't try to articulate it before you really understand it it's like trying to have a baby when you're three months pregnant just let it let that non-vocal part of you know it I said because think about the audience when they leave the theater you can't stop them on the steps outside of Shawshank and go, what, please state the theme of Shawshank Redemption. You don't have that ability, but you're out there like tripping, like, wow, like what an experience. And you got the thematic power of that story has been put into you. You've been transformed. The complete action of the story did something to you. And it did it in Braveheart and Training Day and Blade Runner and The Godfather. You come out of those movies and you're like, whoa. And you don't know. You're, it's not your job to articulate what the movie did to you. It's your job to let that embed in your life and to stay feeling like Michael Corleone all week. And like you're, you're, like, you're looking at things differently and to feel like, Roy Batty at the end of Blade Runner or Deckard or, you know, Jake at the end of Training Day where it imbues you with this transformed experience. And that's what the theme is. It's coming across whether you're in tune with it or not. You as the writer kind of set out to, I'm going to write about this theme and it may be that the theme that you think you're writing about has not much to do with the way in which the protagonist actively resolves the dilemma, if there is a dilemma in your material. But however the protagonist resolves whatever the problem that the protagonist is faced with, that trans 
transfers that kind of thematic intensity into you, even if the filmmaker thinks it's something entirely different. Right. So it's it's a it's a fascinating experience that really shapes the story, gives it a tone, um, and it's the theme of the story. Like once you get the theme of Training Day then you know what the story is about and it um, that's going to come across fully um, and in my book there's a great quote by Sidney Pollack talking about how they worked hard to understand what Tootsie was really about and it took them I think maybe even a couple of years I don't recall exactly but he said that once he understood that Tootsie is like that becoming a woman made a man out of Michael Dorsey, he said, okay, now that's what this picture is about. And now I can communicate that better to the actors, to everybody in the story, and we can shape the story more so that if he's going to be better at something by the end, he has to be worse at it first, so he's even worse with women in the beginning of the story, and he's a total pain in the ass to work with as an actor, even though he's brilliant as an actor, you know, that you're getting at elements of his dilemma. And, um, oh, he talks about, yeah, becoming a woman made a man out of Michael Dorsey. He said that clarity helped so much and it doesn't mean it's going to be a great picture. It just means that I can talk to the actors and talk to the cinematographer and hold the whole thing together because that's what the movie's about. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, Pollock was, uh, was very, very good at articulating what he had. And sometimes the writers talk about it. I think, uh, um, I think it was even Mamet who said he doesn't think about theme, but I think Lamette did when he made the verdict. Mamet, I don't know Mamet what thinks the about theme. Mamet's very explicit about theme. He says some great things. He says that the theme done properly will come across to the audience once clearly and powerfully at the end. And he said, trust your story to do that. He said, writers who are insecure about the ability of their story's theme to come across clearly and powerfully to the audience once at the end will resort to reiterating it constantly. They put it in every 10th line of dialogue. They're beating you to death with it because they're afraid you're not going to get it. And that ruins the drama. Right. Says, yeah, I think it was I think it was Wes Anderson who said he didn't think about theme, and uh -huh. and then uh, Rod Serling said he always started with theme, which is uh -huh. you know he was maybe it was his limitations with the Twilight Zone episodes where he had to crank those things out in just an amazing pace that that he yeah. wrote on that, which I think that's what makes the Twilight Zone you know low budget sometimes in space or science fiction, but yet you always knew it was about something very earthly and, and, and hit right. home. And he was, he was trying to change how you think he wanted to like pull the blinders off you. So you're like, wait, that is how the world works. It's not what he was very subversive and he had a lot to say and he realized you can't just lecture people. So you do it in the form of entertainment and you can still have the same impact. In fact, even more impact with a well-told story that's been properly dramatized can really, you, know, you have an opportunity to not only transform the audience, but kind of upend the whole apple cart in a way. Change yeah. the way everybody thinks about everything, not just one person about the one thing he was talking about. Yeah, much much has been written. I think Frank Darabon talks about it, or maybe Mike, Michael Arndt uh, talks about um, how it's a wonderful life. You know, there's this whole thing about Mr. Potter being the richest man in town. And then at the end, you know, we realize that George Bailey is the richest man in town because he has all these friends. He has his family. Right. He, uh, it's just it's. It's 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 a movie that took me many viewings to really appreciate because when I was in film school, it was all, you know, Frank Capricorn and and all of that stuff to really realize mm -hmm. what you said is that, you know, George Bailey. It's a really dark film when you go back and watch it. It's yeah. not this it's not this hallmark, you know, 
easy film. I mean, he's suicidal no. to start out with. And, yeah, it's uh, a and journey that, and through then, hell. And then you also talk about, just to wrap this up, you talk about kind of that theme coming together at the end. I know in the in your um, in your book you talk about catharsis, where this is kind of the brass knuckles part. A solid jolt, a solid jolt of reality can hit the audience. And uh, what movies do you think of when you think of that solid jolt at the end that that uh, kind of maybe drives home the theme or just pulls it all together? That unity that Aristotle talked about. What what are good examples of that? Well, um, I mean, there's endless examples, but you know, to to just reach out and grab something that, you know, I'll never forget how it impacted me the first time I saw it. And a lot of people, it's one of their all time favorite mo movies is Blade Runner. There's so much emotional power in the end of that. And, you know, the replicants have a four year lifespan and they gradually develop their own emotional responses. And, that Batty, who is at war with Deckard, and Deckard has just killed Pris, Batty's mate, and Batty is still at the end of his four-year lifespan, and he's killed Joseph Tyrell and been unable to solve his quest of undoing the four-year lifespan. I mean, he wants nothing more than to just crush Deckard like a bug, in vengeance, and yet, because replicants develop their own emotional responses as they near the end of their lifespan or as they grow, he perceives in Deckard that he is a fellow soldier, that he's similar to Batty, that he's, you know, that he is out there doing an ugly job that he doesn't want to do. He perceives in Deckard, here's a fellow warrior who doesn't, isn't out to punish me and in fact feels empathy for the replicants and saw how Tyrell threw Rachel away and is just this monster. And Batty spares Deckard and teaches him what it means to really live, talks about the experiences of his life, and gives the gift of life to Deckard, and Deckard wakes up and takes it and runs off with Rachel. And it's a powerful emotional experience that completely caught me by surprise the first time I saw it, and just lodges itself, you know, it's up there at the apex of the great films of all time and the great, you know, movie experiences and you almost remember where you were when you first saw it. So I think that answers your question. Yeah. What, um, you know, when you think of, you know, we've, we've talked about Training Day, we've talked about uh, The Godfather, talked about um what was the last movie we just talked <laughs> oh blade runner we talked blade about blade runner. runner so we talked about uh the godfather training day blade runner a few other movies in there um what do you tell beginning students in your teaching um because they're looking at the top of the mountain they're looking at the crescendos of some screenwriters who have spent 20, 30 years writing, what do you tell them? Because they're obviously going to be frustrated because they're going to hold it up to these, you know, sometimes Oscar winning screenplays and, and wonder why they fall short. Um, talk about the process of how you, you know, you, you obviously talked about two characters talking. Everybody can write two characters talking, but how do you... Well, it's two characters fighting, really. Two, two characters fighting. There we go. Yeah. It, it, Got to get that conflict in there. So... Um, how do you how do you tell people and and what do you teach them about the process like you're you know you're inspired by these great works of art that you see in the theater but uh how do you how do you teach them to bite a uh a, a chunk a chunk of that off or just a bite size of that off and and begin their writing career 
Well, it's tricky because so many people are in a hurry and it's a lot more like becoming a brain surgeon than people think. It's considered the hardest literary form to master. Um, and there's an absolute learning curve on it. And I compare it to uh, learning how to juggle on a unicycle on a tightrope. <laughs> and like, there's people at the circus that can do that all day long. They can be watching the news while they're up there, you know, doing their thing. So it's not impossible, but it's an, a good illustration of a set of skill sets that are, and I use hockey as an example too, because it's like you have to be able to do a lot of things all at once, all at a master level. And people can usually, like your average person can look at a hockey player and go, yeah, I couldn't do that to save my life. And, and for me, who's grown up playing hockey, I can look at a professional hockey player and go, yeah, I couldn't do that to save my life. It's like there's skill sets that you can see just the skating alone or just the stick handling alone, mm -hmm. much less trying to get around people that are trying to put you into the next you know, week with a body slam. There's so many things you have to be doing well. So a lot of it is like respect the craft because it's much harder than you think, but it's also doable and don't let your ambitions be shuffled off to one side or downsized. See, there's a Often there's two different trajectories, one of which is like, I'm going to go off and write the greatest thing anybody's ever seen, and I don't need any training. And sure, once in a while that can work for somebody, but those are people you often see by the side of the road in wreckage a little bit later. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who think, everything's bigger than them and they can't possibly succeed so they'll just limp along and do what they can and you know and they're stuck writing scripts that can be shot for three thousand dollars you know in their grandmother's apartment and you can't spend more than nine hundred like it's like they think themselves small to death <clears throat> so I'm really combining like this is a really complex art form that's very hard to master, but I have a set of unique and powerful tools that can really get you there, but it takes like a good couple years to master the tools, like a brain surgeon would, like you're not going out doing brain surgery on week three of medical school. Yeah, I think uh, I think Price 100 years ago put it this way, uh, no one is born a, a chemist. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's tricky and yet it's doable and keep your sights on writing the next Shawshank Redemption or something like that because you can do it. It's very doable. So stay ambitious, think big, think dangerous go off the deep end, don't make safe choices because then you're writing the same warmed over homogenous stuff that everybody else is writing. You know, it's like you need your voice, you need your ambition, you need your attack as a storyteller and don't let anybody tell you that every story's ever been written and don't think small and don't bite off less than you can chew. Get in over your head. Get stuck. You know, embrace chaos. Get yourself in trouble. <clears throat> and, and yet, learn your craft like a brain surgeon. So you know this stuff inside out, backwards and forwards. You can do it in your sleep. And you end up with <clears throat> rigorous technique as a dramatist and explosive creativity as a storyteller. And a kind of fearless attack mode, like 
if I'm going to write a whacked out, dumb and dumber, goofball comedy, it's going to be the most whacked out thing you've ever seen, and you're going to have trouble breathing because you're going to be laughing so hard. And if I'm going to write a horror story, I'm going to try and, like, fucking stop your heart from the writing. Like, so you're like, I can't even go out in the dark. And if it's an action adventure, we're going to have, like, the most fun we can have. It's, you know, push it and stretch it and... But learn your craft and, like, so that down to the thousandth of a millimeter you can draw ex ex exquisite distinctions like a brain surgeon. Like, no, you don't cut that. You cut this. And hold that away so we don't accidentally cut it. Like, we're doing this right. And you also got to have a real sense of adventure so that your rigorous technique doesn't get in the way of the story and that your understanding of the guiding principles allows you to adjust the tools and adapt the technique because if you're being guided by the by the principles then you're still getting to the same place even if you're doing it slightly differently so there's a great rigor and there's a great flexibility and there's a great adventure and there's a great you know love of storytelling and emotional power and really impacting an audience so it's a lot of things all at once and then even after all that it's going to take you some years to acquire that deep seasoned mastery of it just because you just got out of grad school and you're now a brain surgeon you look at the brain surgeon who's been working professionally for 10 years and that's where you're going to see the deep mastery so it's a it's a big you're biting off a big chunk but it's very doable yeah well you've been teaching since 1989 um last yeah. question how do you know you you mentioned you've written a couple of books you you have a new series a new teaching series it's pretty exhaustive from what you told me and uh, how can people find out more about you and your uh, classes my website is script.kitchen. There's no .com. It's just script.kitchen. Um, I am running a two-year training program that you can join and take by the month. Um, you just pay 400 a month, and you can take it as long as you want. You have to do a few prerequisite things to join the live daily training program where we're constantly building multiple scripts. But it's not that hard to acquire enough mastery of the tools to jump in with this. Um, yeah, it's a live Zoom class. So there's students uh, Australia, New Zealand, India, Romania, England. Uh, so it's all like over two the place. in the morning in Jakarta when you're having a class or something? <laughs> yeah, it varies. I, I try to do classes at different times. And I can add more classes for people that are out of the proper time zone. But I'm just trying to make it as hands-on and practic practical so that you get real know-how. A lot of training techniques, they just shovel information at you and expect you to piece that together into a functional know-how. But we're very much, it's an, it's an apprenticeship and it's in fact a model known as cognitive apprenticeship where you're not just learning the techniques but you're learning how I think. But it's very much like as far away from classroom lecture format as possible. It's more of like a plumbing apprenticeship and it's like come on onto the house with me we're gonna <clears throat> you know fit all these pipes together. <clears throat> and that's how you're going to learn it rather than sitting in a classroom learning plumbing. We're constantly Great. building real scripts in real time. Do you have any closing words of inspiration for uh, somebody that's uh, thinking, man, I'd really like to start writing a screenplay. Where, where do I start? Yeah. Um, the main thing I would say is that you want to have substantial craft as a dramatist as much as you can get it but you never want to lose that fearless attack mode that is the part of your brain that's going I want to write a movie I want to write a killer TV series I want to write a stage play or a novel that like blows people away 
because it's like a combination of being a brain surgeon and like being an Indiana Jones, like being this unstoppable adventurer. You need both. And so don't let that fearless part of you go, but also respect the craft and learn it and find someone who has substantial craft as a dramatist. Just storytelling is not enough because it's a performance medium. It has to work on stage with real actors and it constantly has to hold an audience consistently on the edge of their seat. It's a very specific craft. Very good, very good. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, I, I wish you sure the thing. best with, with your, you and your students and, uh, and keep in touch. All right, and check out my brand new book, The Hero's Dilemma. It's all about how to build a, build a script around a dilemma right from square one.